Well, I've got four o'clock, so um, we should probably get ourselves going. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. I think a few more people will be coming in as, as uh, we get going. But um, uh, first of all, I'm Mary Alice Snetzinger. I'm uh, with the Land Conservancy for Kingston, Frontenac, Lennox and Addington. And um, I'd like to also acknowledge and thank our sponsor, Burt's Greenhouses. So we're going to welcome a couple of pre presenters today who are going to give us some practical advice. After the presentations, we'll be sharing some photos, um, uh, photographs that people have submitted, and we'll hear from the folks that submitted them. And they're going to talk about their efforts to support pollinators and attract nature to their yards. After the photo sharing, we're going to have a random draw for a $50 gift certificate from our sponsor. Um, Burt Greenhouses is a local nursery dedicated to ecological gardening, so we really appreciate their support today. So just a couple of housekeeping notes before we get into it. Um, I think most of us are getting used to Zoom, but uh, just in case there is a little microphone down the bottom left hand corner of your screen uh, on most devices, I believe, you, you should find a little microphone button. Please keep yourself muted unless uh, you're prompted to present, until you're prompted to present your photograph. Just makes a better listening experience for the rest of us. Uh, video, the little camera sign. Again, you can toggle these on and off, but just by clicking on the icon, um, you can choose whether you want your video on or off. And uh, the third thing to note is the chat function. Uh, Obviously, a few people have already got that, but if you have questions for the speakers particularly, put it in the chat. We will be trying to monitor that as we go along. So a little bit about us. Uh, we're the Land Conservancy for Kingston, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington. We're an all-profit, <laughs> we're an all-volunteer, non-profit uh, group. We're a charity, non-government organization, and we're all about um, protecting nature or your local land trust. We are currently protecting 11 properties and we have 310 hectares, which is 766 acres. And our intent is to provide safe havens, permanent safe havens for nature. Uh, we're going to have presentations uh, today from uh, Dr. Vicki Wojcik and Master Gardener Joyce Hostin. And I should note for everyone's benefit that we will be sending out an email to all the participants after the event that's going to include a list of resources. So you don't really need to worry about noting everything down. Uh, after, the, after the speakers, we'll move on to the photo sharing and you'll get a chance to speak about any photos that you may have shared with us. Okay, I'll just uh, let you know who Vicki is. Vicki, uh, Dr. Vicki Wojcik is a, the Director of Research and Programs at the Canadian Branch of Pollinator Partnership, which is a not-for-profit dedicated to the conservation of and research on pollinators and their ecosystems. And Dr. Wojcik is going to talk about planting for nature. Thanks, Mariella. So I'm um, happy to say hello to everyone while the troubleshooting is ongoing. I still can't share my screen, but that's okay. But I'm really excited to give you all an overview of planting for pollinators and other beneficial uh, species that can visit your garden and the impact that can have on both our biodiversity uh, and the status of some endangered and threatened species. Thanks everyone. Uh, a little technical glitch, but you already know my background and what I'm talking about. So I'll jump right in to keep us uh, on deck. And there's some slowness. Oh gosh. In any case, uh, pardon me, I'm having a little bit slowness uh, moving my slides, but I'll do my best as well. So um, I'm the director at Pollinator Partnership Canada, and we are a uh, national charity in Canada dedicated to the support of pollinators, the ecosystem services that they support and all of the benefits that they provide. One of every three bites of food that we eat is brought to you by pollinators. That's about 80% of crop varieties. And some of you may have already been familiar with this statistic. And there's some great 
background visuals that we can show you to really drive home the impact. So here's a great photo of your average grocery store full of fruits and vegetables with bees and what the grocery store will look like if pollinators were just not in the picture. So not everything's gone, but most of it is. And actually, even if food doesn't disappear absolutely in the absence of pollinators, we often find that it doesn't develop as well, um, both in terms of like size and quality, but nutritional value. So pollinators are really vital to how we eat, how we live our lives. And the roles that pollinators play are not just restricted to the food that we eat, they're incredibly beneficial to wildlife and the ecosystems that we live in. So they create habitat. More than 85%, so essentially all terrestrial plants, require pollinators to reproduce. That same picture I showed you with food and then no food, that would be exactly what your natural landscape would look like. Plants, no plants, if pollinators were to disappear. Pollinators also pollinate the food plants of wildlife that we find really important, such as songbirds, um, other large wildlife. Their, their activities, like how they live their life, aerate the soil. A lot of them nest in the ground and help cycle nutrients. And then they're also a direct food source, especially if we're speaking about um, insect pollinators for wildlife that we care about, such as birds. And for all these great benefits, there, there's a lot of challenges pollinators are facing. And one of the key ones is that their habitat is threatened. So the, the space that they live in is um, either diminished or the nutritional quality of the plants is just not there. The species are not there. Invasive plants are taking over. They need good habitat. And it sounds simplistic, but it is actually the exact steps that we need to take to protect pollinators Helping pollinators means supporting habitat. So I'm giving away some of the details of how you support pollinators in this slide before I get into the presentation. But by providing good habitat, which means you're providing bloom throughout the season, you're focusing on local native species, you're planting a variety of forbs and shrubs and trees, you have a structured complex garden that groups plants together, it's very well sunlit, you don't use pesticides, and you provide nesting habitat, which is stalks and leaves and that messy part of the garden, you're creating habitat for pollinators and supporting them so that they can support us. It's, it's a wonderful story. <clears throat> so I wanted to give you a little more detail though. So I just told you how you do it. That was really high level, very basic. But when we're gardening, we can do a lot of things to garden specifically for pollinator types we'd like to attract. We can choose the plant species, but we can choose it based on what color it is, what shape it is, how it looks in terms of our aesthetic, and really match that up with the pollinators we'd like to attract. There's this concept in pollination biology called pollinator syndromes. And the chart I'm showing you here is a little detailed, but basically it lists all of those different pollinators out there. Uh, the bees, the birds, the butterflies. Um, this one also includes bats. Now in Canada, we don't have bats. Our only vertebrate pollinators are birds, hummingbirds. But nevertheless, this full range of pollinator types and what flowers they're more attracted to. So for example, bees tend to be attracted to very bright flowers. Colors, quite variable, but they can also see ultraviolet. So it's these flowers that have this ultraviolet spectrum. Bees like a flower that's either has a really nice landing pad or has a little tube that they can crawl into. Uh, they love nectar and pollen. And um, they often also go towards uh, plants that have nectar guides. So these little patches of color that direct them. Uh, if you want a different perspective on that, something like a hummingbird really likes bright orange and yellow flowers that are tubular, that provide a lot of nectar because they use a lot of um, energy in flight when they forage. So this chart is a background to how you should start thinking and structuring your mind when you want to design a garden to support a specific pollinator. And this great little Canadian Wildlife Federation poster actually shows that in much more color here where we have a bunch of different flower types and pollinators visiting them. And again, we have the pollinator syndromes really nicely displayed with a butterfly landing on a nice flat, pink flower. 
Um, we have a bee on a yellow disc shaped flower uh, and all of those things. So this is wonderful. I'm going to give you a little bit more background about each individual pollinator group and their biology so that you can think like that pollinator or you know enough about them that when you design your garden, you can have their needs in mind. <clears throat> so quick overview of the biology of bees. In Canada, there are more than 800 species of bees and most of them actually are solitary bees. They live alone. They're not honeybees that live in a hive. In fact, honeybees aren't native to North America. They play a great role in agriculture, but in terms of our native ecosystems, they're not a significant player. Native bees nest in the ground, in dried grasses or twigs or in other pre-existing holes. So here you see how that concept of a messy garden where you don't take away the leaves and leave your old stalks is really important. They also have very short seasons that they live in. The average lifespan is two to four weeks. So throughout the entire season, we have bees, but there's a different bee that's around in the early spring and a different one in the summer and then in the late summer. And they also have very unique feeding preferences. So they're perhaps the pickiest when it comes to the plants they like. And here's just another view of the life cycle of bees. You see the adult bee foraging on a flower, but what you don't see is the pollen ball that the bee has collected with an egg laid on it that then grows into a larva, pupates and hatches out as an adult bee and the cycle continues over again. Next pollinator, the flies. And flies are actually wonderful pollinators, especially of native plants. And especially as we move further north, some more boreal ecosystems, uh, flies take on a huge role. They like a lot of the same flowers as bees do. Uh, they're not as mechanically adept as bees are using their legs. So they need a simple disc-shaped flower usually that's really easy to access the nectar. Uh, so yes, they do visit many of the same flowers. They tend color-wise to prefer white flowers, also yellow. And something about flies when we're considering the entire life cycle of the pollinator when we're building our garden is that they need leaf litter for their larva to develop. So unlike bees, which will nest in the ground and dig a hole, often flies will lay an egg in old leaf litter or some moist soil just on top of it. And if we clean up all of that vegetation, you're actually removing the developing um, insects that will become flies, which again, may have sometimes gotten a bad reputation, but they're really important, great pollinators of native plants. It's another shot of a fly called the bombolid bee fly. Um, they're, these guys are great. They're super fast and they have a really, really long proboscis. So while this is the fly, these guys can actually visit flowers that are very similar to some of the moth flowers because they have a very long tongue. All right, butterflies, another great pollinator that we all love attracting to our garden. The thing about butterflies is that in addition to the flower choice that the adult likes to feed on, they need larval host plants for their caterpillars. Adult butterflies lay eggs on plants and then those eggs hatch into larva or caterpillar and that caterpillar eats the plant leaves before it's ready to pupate and become an adult. So you have to have the plants that the butterfly is eating there if that's a whole part of the life cycle you'd like to attract. Butterfly plants also do provide large amounts of nectar because butterflies do quite a bit of flying. And they also need areas with good sunlight. Um, and another point about butterflies, which I'll show you with the monarch butterfly life cycle, is that many species are actually migratory. So they need habitat, not only at a specific point in time, but in a specific area physically um, throughout the year, and that can change. So the monarch butterfly is one of our quintessential um, migratory butterflies. It's also a species at risk. So here's a brief review of its life cycle. There's an egg that's laid on a milkweed plant. So milkweed is really vital for monarch butterflies. It hatches into a caterpillar that grows many times, pupates as an adult, um, and then as an adult, it's feeding on nectar, mating, laying an egg, and the cycle goes over and over again. This cycle actually occurs multiple times throughout the year. And in the context of the monarch butterfly, monarch butterflies, um, we know that they exist in, up here in Ontario, but they overwinter in Mexico. So they migrate from Canada all the way through the United States into Mexico, and then back up the following year. 
they're resident in Canada from about May through to August. So while um, they do have this incredible journey, there's multiple generations of monarch butterflies, uh, two to three generations that will occupy your garden if you have the right plants for them. Another pollinator that's often uh, not really gardened for actively are the beetles. So beetles are one of the most prolific um, pollinators in that there's more than 200,000 species of beetles that visit plants. Now they're usually not the best pollinators because they're not adapted the way bees are to carry pollen, but they certainly do um, get dusted with it and move from plant to plant. And often with a lot of low growing native plants, there are key pollinator species. Beetles like butterflies um, need that extra part of the habitat to live in. So you need to consider your leaf litter, your plant stems and your soil as part of the beetle habitat. And in terms of the flowers they like, they're um, again, a little bit clumsy, so to speak. So they prefer really open uh, cup shaped flowers that help them access the pollen easily. And the last pollinator that we have some gardening tips for uh, is the hummingbird. So adult hummingbirds are the ones that are actually the pollinators. They visit flowers for nectar, it fuels their flight um, and it's that their main food source. So they need trees to nest in, and they also need small insects present because that's what they feed their young. So they are not feeding their young nectar, they're feeding their young small flies and other caterpillars that they find. Um, so if you're gardening with hummingbirds in mind, you do really want to consider if your total habitat, in addition to providing nectar from tubular plants that are uh, often red, orange, or pink in color, are you providing nesting resources and the vertical structure that attracts them? So I just gave you a lot of background about what this pollinator likes and what that pollinator likes. It actually gives you more choices than you can even handle for how to create your garden using native flowers. So uh, a tool set that Pollinator Partnership has for you is this set of planting guides, uh, these little planting card recipe cards to plant your pollinator garden. Now, this one you'll notice is for the Northeastern United States, but the ecological zone that it represents is the same one that we're in, in in Ontario. So it is a great kind of plug and play template for you to take and plant in a garden if you'd like to attract pollinators. So for example, um, it, on the one side, I'll just go back to show you, it's got a great list of and photos of what these plants look like. And on the other side, it gives you some of these garden tips that I just mentioned to you about um, how many seasons or how many plants you want to have them bloom throughout the season, how you want to maintain your garden. Um, and it also gives you your first best choice and a second choice of um, a subset of pollinator plants. So we've got nine species here that you can plant to create your garden. And if you do go with this planting list, and I'll go back to the more engaging slide just to talk about it, you actually have all the plants here to attract butterflies. So you have your Joe Pye weed and you have milkweed, which will specifically attract, um, uh, pardon me, monarch butterflies. You've got um, red columbine and cardinal flower, which are great for butterflies, uh, pardon me, um, hummingbirds, but also some butterflies. And the purple flowers, the bee balm and the New England aster, those will really get all the bees quite interested in visiting this garden. So not only is it diverse, it's attracting all the pollinators. And here's a quick list for you to try and go ahead with. And one last point that I will make about uh, the pollinator gardening is, I touched on it before, but it's pesticides and pollinators. And we really, really recommend that when you are actively habitat gardening for pollinators or other wildlife, you don't use pesticide, especially pesticide relating to cosmetic issues. Um, in terms of pollinator health and pesticides, you often hear about pollinator poisoning and that usually happens when a pesticide is applied on a plant and a pollinator visits it right away. And this is not the way pesticides are supposed to be applied. So it's usually an accident. It's usually often reported in the news that you see all these dead pollinators, but that's actually not the bigger problem. The bigger problem is the indirect impact of pesticides that are used even in a responsible way because they're in the environment and present. 
And we have information from research that shows that butterflies, if they're constantly in contact with pesticides, they can reduce the time it takes for them to develop, uh, which actually means the butterfly is developing faster than some of its plants that would naturally be blooming. So that's a mismatch. It's not something we'd like. Their survival, the weight of the pupa and their wing size can be impacted. And all of this can make it more difficult for a butterfly to fly, especially one that migrates like a monarch. And for bees, there's evidence that shows that bees that are exposed to pesticides can have cognitive impairments. And this is so important for bees because they actually do a lot of learning to learn where flowers are, how to handle a flower. So having an impairment means they're actually not able to pollinate or visit or get food. And they've also been shown to have smaller body size or produce less eggs. So again, I mean, I'm driving home the point here, but when we're wildlife habitat gardening, uh, there's no place for pesticides in that landscape. And as a last point, I wanted to mention that one of the programs that we have at Pollinator Partnership now is the Bee City Canada program, where cities can register to become a bee city. And I would encourage anyone on this presentation uh, that's from Kingston or the general Kingston area to consider uh, working with their um, municipal government to register as a bee city. As of yet, there aren't any local bee cities on the map. And it's a great initiative to really um, not only get yourself, but get the whole city on board with the concept of providing habitat for pollinators. And I'll leave you with the Pollinator Pledge, which we are encouraging everyone to do. And it's so fitting for this presentation because you're all interested in how you can garden for pollinators. So the Pollinator Pledge is choosing to actively create habitat for pollinators using native plants in your garden, trying to get at least three plants blooming in each season, um, uh, purchasing pesticide-free plants and gardening without pesticides, choosing to leave the leaves, actively promoting pollinators and habitats in, with signage and outreach, and also being climate conscious in your daily choices because climate change is a big threat to pollinators. So I'll leave it there and thank you very much for having me speak here. I'm happy to answer any questions. Our monarch butterfly caterpillar can sit and watch and um, Thank you very much, Vicki. There are quite a few questions, so I'll, I'll uh, keeping in mind the time, I'll run through a few of them, um, and maybe you can you can tackle them. Someone's asking, uh, we have in our household a person allergic to bees and wasps. Would this negatively impact having a nature-friendly garden and increase risk to their health? And so in, in theory, it shouldn't. And the reason I say in theory is because most people that are allergic to bees and wasps um, have encounters with honeybees and yellow jackets. So those are, um, yellow jackets are not going to be attracted to any of this pollinator planting that you do because they're actually carnivorous and they're foraging on um, uh, usually caterpillars. Honeybees very well may be impacted, uh, pardon me, attracted, but they also, in terms of their stinging behavior, are often more on the defensive close to their hive. So again, this concept of getting stung by a bee um, off of a flower in your garden is quite rare. That's usually not where stinging incidents occur. So that's one, one piece of advice there that it's generally not a fear. Now, if someone is severely and anaphylactically allergic to insect stings and you still want to garden for pollinators, you can take some of the information we have here and really shift your gardening palette to include uh, plants that are more attractive to butterflies, hummingbirds, and moths. And that way you still have the pollinator bonus. And in your yard where you spend most of your time, you're creating a safer space. Oh, that's great. I've got another question. I had mining bees on my front lawn for 15 years, and then we had a wet spring and I had to remove a lilac with shade to get at the water main. There are still a few. Will they come back? So they should. So mine, yeah, mining bees, um, for those that aren't familiar, they're uh, one of the many bees that nests in the ground and they aggregate nest, meaning that a bunch of bees will nest together. That's why you often see a whole yard full of them. But what they also do is year over year, recolonize the same location. So if you said that there's still a few present, you should expect over time, if the soil quality is still um, consistent and the way they like it, 
they should continue to expand and, and recolonize the area. Okay. Uh, I've got a question. I wonder how significant hummingbirds really are as pollinators. Based on many photos, their long beak and tongue seldom seem to result in pollen on the feathers at the base of the beak. So where does the pollen get carried to? Yeah, yeah, no, and that's actually, I really like that question because it lets me talk about the, I guess, um, the value of all pollinators to actual plant reproduction. And generally speaking, it is bees and flies that are the absolute dominant pollinators of most plants. Uh, there's very few plant species that are specialized to be only pollinated by something other than a bee or a fly, although they do exist. For us, in our landscape, the plants that hummingbirds visit are also pollinated by bees, so they're not the main pollinators. When we do go further south into the tropics, then you do actually see floral structures that definitely interact with a hummingbird. So a hummingbird visits, gets covered where you would expect on its chin with pollen, and goes um, further. Uh, plants in the bromeliad family growing naturally in the tropics are ones that are, po um, pardon me, hummingbird pollinated, and you'll see that in their floral structure. Great question. Okay, and sort of a continuation, what about wasps? So wasps actually, um, they're a very diverse group. And there's a subset of wasps called pollen wasps. Uh, and they would pollinate a lot of similar plants that bees pollinate. But bees and pollen wasps and flies, uh, uh, they like the same plants. So often if a plant is bee pollinated, it's also uh, fly and wasp pollinated. Um, so yeah, again, uh, uh, these are great questions. People are really thinking, but absolutely, they play a role in pollination. And I, that brings up another point is that we're often taught in school, especially if we take evolutionary biology, that there's a plant and a pollinator and they've co-evolved and it's just this wonderful system, which is true, but the one plant, one pollinator interaction is actually quite rare. What's really common which is actually great, especially in light of climate change and, and species loss, is that you see pollinator networks where multiple pollinators visit a single plant and a single um, is it for pollination, and then a pollinator will visit multiple plants for food. So there's a lot of redundancy. Okay, I think we'll do one more question. I just will mention to people that this is be, being recorded. So uh, someone someone asked that, but the chat is starting to get ahead of me now. Uh, somebody asked, um, is ant killer considered pesticide, which I think we can, but there's several people that have commented uh, further on ants. So maybe I could ask you to just comment a little about ants as pollinators, Nikki. So uh, that's again, a, a great little question there. So, um, in terms of the ant killer and pesticide, that's more of like a registration question. So it depends on what, what chemical compositions in there. Um, it, that if it's actually a pesticide, like that's registered, but likely the way it works is if um, they take it back and they poison uh, the colony. Okay, sorry, I just answered my own question and apologies for uh, thinking out loud a little bit. So those ant bait traps that you're using, okay. Um, those ants are not pollinating ants. Now there are pollinating ants out there and even some records of pollinating ants in our climate. But ants are a funny one because they're very accidental in pollinating. They often um, take care of and interact with plants and actually protect those plants from other pollinators, pardon me, from pests. And then they'll get a grain of pollen on them or not. And they're it, when they are pollinators of plants, it's usually low growing um, arid desert species. So again, not super common for us. So um, if you're using an ant bait, you're not harming a potential pollinator in our ecosystem. It's, it's very unlikely. So most of the ants that we would consider pest ants that we're trying to deal with, they're not interacting with flowers. They're finding food in like fungus or leaf litter and they're not going to be the ones that are pollinating. And if they are pollinating ants, they're super rare too. Okay. Well, I hope most of the questions got answered. I think we probably need to move on to our second speaker. Uh, well, then I'll you, stop sharing now and thank you very much. And I'm looking oh, forward you, to the rest of the presentation. That was, that was great, Vicki. Thank you so much.
Um, uh, hopefully everyone got their questions answered. Um, we will be keeping an eye on the chat and trying to keep up with you. So keep using that feature, please. So our second speaker is the Master Gardener, Joyce Hostin. Um, Joyce will suggest ways to transform your garden into a mini forest. Um, Ms. Hostin is the co-creator of Little Forests Kingston, and she's going to share information with us on how to rewild our yards. Joyce. Hey, sorry, I just had to unmute myself. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so I'm coming about wilding our yards from my own rewilding story of my yard, which is a forest. And how do you transform your yard into a forest? Why would you transform your yard into a forest? I live in a typical suburb, like probably most of us on the call. It's an older neighborhood with large front yards my front yard. This is what it looked like when I moved in. It was carpeted in asphalt grass, junipers, and one lonely little birch tree, probably a European birch. We had enough asphalt, wings on each side of the driveway, plus a circular driveway, so we could have parked like a whole fleet of vehicles. The lawn took an hour and a half to mow, a lot of mowing. And we didn't have a lot of wildlife robins, like everyone has robins on their lawn. And as you can tell from my kids' maps, ants featured big in the yard. <clears throat> my husband really wanted a normal front yard when I first started saying, let's uh, get rid of the grass. But fortunately, he left town for a few weeks at one point and I got started. <laughs> 10 years later, and now it's uh, 25 years later. So this is maybe 10 years into it. You can see the asphalt is gone. And this is entering in the front yard. Turn left at the fork in the path. Pass a flowering stump. I didn't plant the stump. It flowered all on its own. And you can see in that top right corner, there's my uh, front window at the time, it was my office. And one morning about 6 a.m., I look out the window and the next picture I actually didn't get a picture of because I wasn't, didn't have a camera, but there was a saw wet owl sitting in my front window, hiding in the vine. One year, my sister came to visit, I think it was about six years ago. And this is like the corner, the front corner of one side of my, where that driveway, one part of the driveway used to be. And we were walking down the street and she says, turn around, turn around, walk back. So we walk back and then she's like, turn around and let's walk you know, forward again. And we had to do that three times. And what she was doing is like listening to the sound difference between my yard and the yards down the street. And that sound was all the insects and the wildlife. If you decide to wild your front yard, you may face a few obstacles. Um, I had a neighbor who kept threatening me that the city would come and he had a cat who preferred my yard because my yard had interesting things into it. But on the Master Gardener website, if you are afraid of running into bylaw, we have a lot of suggestions about what you can do. And we would actually support you if you wanted to uh, challenge bylaw. We had judgment. My kids, friends, parents, <laughs> we got to hear about what they thought about our house because I spent my time in my garden. I think plant nurseries are actually, and box stores and stuff are actually one of those challenges. And this is something I did when I first got started is going into a garden center and wanting one of all kinds of things. We've got a blog post and I've actually put it in the chat because somebody asked in, in, the, in the chat on Vicky's presentation about where you can source seeds and plants. And we have a blog post up of um, all the areas, all the nurseries and sources for seeds where you can get native plants. So think about, this is the way I'd like to think about rewilding or wilding your yard, is think about it as a conversation with the land. And um, one of the ways the conversation got started in our yard was I would collect black walnuts, that's what those are in the background, bring them home, thinking that I would crack them and eat them, and as you can see, they, the shell, the outer 
that when the outer rind kind of decomposes and gets all black and gooky if you don't get around to doing something with them, at which point your husband may decide to toss them outside, which is what would happen. And uh, the squirrels love that idea. And they're the ones who planted my nine black walnuts that I have in my yard. And they've got forgetful memories. And so, of course, some of them grew and uh, they're grand kittens. I didn't know that that's what squirrel babies are called, but they're called kittens. And their grand kittens get to enjoy them. Those are three of my black walnuts there behind the echinacea. One of the things I learned, and I mentioned the nursery and the temptation of the nurseries at the beginning. And so these are some of the things I've banished from my yard that either I planted by mistake or somebody gifted me, or yeah, I think a couple of them came in on their own. There's a lot of, even now the nursery sell a lot of invasive plants. So keep an eye out for those and don't buy them. And then I really started to discover the beauty of native plants and um, who they would attract. And this is um, Virginia waterleaf, which is a great ground cover in shady areas. And since I've got a forest now, I have to think about shade plants. And just because you have a forest doesn't mean you can't attract a whole ream of pollinators and wildlife. These are some of the, and I have more than this, but some of the native shrubs and um, understory trees I have. There are so many gorgeous ones that are actually quite hard to get in the nurseries, but the list that I shared in the chat is, you can source all of them through that list. And the one that you see here with that, is called um, a pagoda dogwood, also kind of known as the wedding cake layer tree because it does layers as it grows up and it gets beautiful spring flowers and the birds, as soon as the berries start to ripen, they descend on it. One of the things I didn't know until last year though, was that often again, you'll see in some of the nurseries, um, things like elderberry, nine bark and choke cherry saying that they're native plants, but they're cultivars of native plants that are called nativars. And some of those are actually have been found to be very problematic. You buy them because you think you're supporting wildlife, but some of them, particularly in the shrub category, if they have purple leaves, there's some something in the chemistry that makes them unattractive to some of those beetles and other creatures that you were hoping to attract. So going for the straight species is often a wise idea. I got to meet new butterflies. And this is a giant swallowtail, which is a more recent um, resident in our area, I think the last 20 years or so. And this is a hop tree, its favorite um, food source. And there's not many hop trees around here because they're Carolinian forest, which is near Toronto. But we're with climate change, we're becoming much more Carolinian. So you get to, and this, I have giant swallowtails visiting every year now. I haven't found their eggs yet, but walking in the forest, they also like um, prickly ash. And this is what the caterpillars look like, which I think is like a pretty entertaining. And just a shot of the hop tree seeds in the winter. We forget that the beauty of many of these plants are see all season. Birds, those are somebody else who's come to visit my yard. And this is a duck that I hadn't realized was nesting in my yard until she left and I was sitting in my front window and she walked down the front walk with her chicks and uh, walked over to the creek and jumped in. Wrens come every year and the insects are crucial for our birds. So even the insects that you're not trying to attract for pollinator purposes, all those insects, 98% um, of birds feed their young, including hummingbirds, they feed their young insects. Other creatures, <clears throat> kids love wild yards. Here's some of the trees. The only one of these trees that I've actually planted myself is the tulip tree. The oaks, the three types of oaks, the black walnut, the bitternut hickory, and the sugar maple all came in on their own. So just by stopping mowing, is one of the ways that you can get started. And here's some of the ones that I haven't tried yet, but now that my forest is growing taller, learning some of these native understory lower shrubs. And this is a um, 
maple leaf viburnum and it's in the forest near my house and it's gorgeous. That's not as red as it gets. It gets even redder than that in the fall and it has berries and it has spring flowers to attract pollinators. So when you rewild, you're questioning, you're challenging the definition of normal. And uh, that includes like, what's the definition of a weed? This, this, um, oh, I'm blanking on the name of this uh, woodpecker, but downy woodpecker loves the mullion. Another normal question is like, why are yards flatlands? Even by making a bit of a topography, a bit of a mound, you have microclimates that favor different species of shrubs, understory, and trees. Fall cleanup, I don't do cleanup. In fact, I bring in things like other people's leaves. You can spot me with my little Hyundai going around people's yards and collecting. You're supposed to space trees 15 meters apart. If anything you read online tells you the proper spacing of trees. Well, you can see my, uh, my pine trees there are spaced very closely. And that partly came from me sitting there and thinking, well, in a forest, they're not spaced 15 meters apart. And then some time in Germany and they had front yard forests. And I thought just the trunks, even in winter, they're gorgeous close together. And now that I know that they partner, the roots partner in the ground, ground through mycorrhizae, so they support each other. So it's not competition. There's a lot of cooperation happening. The notion of curb appeal. I just hate that notion. It's like, is it about curb appeal or is it about what appeals to your soul, what appeals to the natural world? And this is now my front deck, well, my front sitting area. And you can see like we don't use our front yards so many people and it's because they're lawns and we feel exposed. You plant a little forest and you get to be surrounded by the natural world. Rewilding, I see it as a, about cultivating relationship with place. Like who do I want to become? For me, I want to become rooted in where we live. And to me, that's getting to know all the, the trees, the shrubs, the insects, the birds that live around us. We're in um, Eco District 6E, and I, again, this is something I knew more recently, they talk about when you're buying plants, they talk about like zone, we're in zone 5B or 6 now. What's really more important is that we're in Eco District 6E, and there's forests that, it's a naturally forested area, and there's tree species and shrub species that naturally like to live here. Striving, and Vicky mentioned, striving to see from an insect's point of view. So how do we strive? And this is something I try and do now, try and see things from a bird's point of view. They want insects, they want shelter, they want food. I'm asking who visits and who doesn't. This, I think, and Vicky can probably tell me, and Vicky may put it in the chat, is this a honeybee? But this is um, a native bulb that came in all on its own. Um, and I always blank when it comes, it's that very early spring bulb. And if you let your yard start naturalizing, it will come in and the bees love it. Learning to see things like a tree and seeing it for who it is, not who I think it should be and how it should fit in my landscape. So black walnuts and seeing them as beings and how they see their situation, that they have gifts, behaviors, relationships, language, spirit and characteristics. So really I'm trying to get to know the trees as beings. I'll stand back and look at my yarn and think layers, blooming, bare spots, privacy. So I'm always kind of sitting there and thinking, oh, how do I fill in the gaps? What's missing? But the question I now ask a lot is spiders, dragonflies, fireflies, birds, bees, moss. These are some of the creatures that I'm thinking more and more and more about. And what plants do I need to add or what habitat do I need to add to attract them? And doing this from inside as well, often we think when we're designing about outside and the outside view, but we spend a lot of time indoors, especially in winter. So how do we design from the inside? This is another front yard sitting spot. I have three front yard sitting spots that are all pretty um, private. And for some reason, it just felt like there, I had a whole bunch of stumps. So I made a stump circle and I'll sit there with my glass of wine and drink a glass of wine in my stump circle. Views, this is a view from that front window. Again, I mentioned views. 
invitations, the path, this path is the path to my front door. And I only moved it about three years ago. I left the old driveway. I turned it into like a path and realized that was the wrong spot for it. When I saw these three, um, the three trunks from the black walnuts, it just felt like that's where the path should go. Focal points in yard art. We buy objects, but stumps are one of my favorite focal points. And you can see they bloom with uh, fungi. <laughs> they bloom with mushrooms. And later on, they become habitat. You can see the little green sweat peas. I was so excited this year. Two of my stumps, they turned out to be places, I think they're, or mining, is this, yeah, sweat pea, I think. They uh, set up residence this winter in the stumps. So next spring, I'm really excited to see, maybe I'll get to see them coming out. And uh, flickers, all kinds of beings come and visit my stumps. And so I'm always adding more. Rotten grass becomes fireflies. Jap Japan has 72 micro seasons. I love how every five days their micro seasons change and it gets you noticing things more. Fireflies are one, my yard is just populated with fireflies. And for that, you need things like those dead leaves. Observing who comes, I mentioned pagoda dogwood earlier. The pagoda dogwood there on the left, that's it blooming in the spring. And that's a, that's a seedling from um, one of my other pagoda dogwoods and they just pop up and I tend to let them be. Who goes? That was a twist honey, twisty baby black locust. One of the mistakes I made and you know, a cultivar of maybe an invasive black locust and they don't do well. So I've shifted from thinking about plants to thinking about layers, communities, insects, birds, and food webs. This is just right along my ditch. And originally I tried planting it with creeping thyme, thinking, you know, low, low ground cover layer. And you can see that the plants had a different idea. And I have a lot of more insects as a result. So rewilding with little forests. What are little forests? And uh, well, here's uh, my yard touching on the neighbor's yard. And if they stop mowing, there that little strip would become a little forest. This is a little baby hop tree that's popped up in a spot in my yard. So one of the things you can do is just ask yourself, if you do nothing, what might happen? Who might come to visit? Who might set up shop? Beauty will appear in many forms. And one of the plants, I never knew about it, and many of you might not either because it's not been much talked about, are sedges. <clears throat> and sedges actually attract pollinators. They're awesome in a shade garden. There's sedges that like the sunny areas as well. And so this woodland sedge came in all on its own and it's grassy, it's green all year. The rabbits nibble on it in spring and hopefully leave some of my other plants alone. And there it is right beside the black walnut. I planted the goldenrod, the fireworks goldenrod at the left near the front of my forest and area. And the Asters on the right, the New England asters, they came in all on their own as if they just knew the combination would be gorgeous. You hear things like black walnuts kill everything. Well, not if you get to know black walnuts. There's so many beings that love them, including this Luna moth, which I haven't seen one in my yard yet. And I'd read that potentially they're no longer in Ontario, but I checked iNaturalist and there have been some sighted. So I'm hoping one day one comes to visit. And as you can see, this is a palette I put together as I've been thinking and playing with what grows with black walnuts since I have so many. And there's many, 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 many plants of different layers that love walnuts. So this is, we're planting little forests in Kingston. And so I'm talking really about front yard little forests here, but we're planting community little forests as well. We're planting four this year and there's a group of us. And this is the process that we're using. They're based on a Mayawaki and Japanese fellows method. And we start with the kinship group soon into the land. And so the Kingston area, and then the soil with, because um, much of our soil has been degraded, sourcing indigenous seedlings, planting them really densely. So that again, going against the convention of planting things far apart. We're planting three per square meter, which is really tight. We weed and water and protect them for three years and then their self, they, they take care of themselves. And they invite so many other species, 
plants, insects, birds will keep coming in is what I'm seeing in my own yard. And I think what is really, really beautiful about what happens is that they then become mother forests that will seed more forests. We've put together this list and this is available on the Master Gardener website forest type, wildlife forest, a wet forest, a Carolinian forest, and a nut forest. And the five layers, one, two, three, four, five, yeah, checking. And the different layers of that forest and the trees that you can choose from each one. So just to try and make it really simple, if you wanna create your own little forest, you can use this list depending on the site conditions that you have to put together a forest that will attract all kinds of species. If you already have a single tree, or a tree or a layer, then you just think up or down. If you've got some shrubs and want to start a forest, then you look back at the list and pick some of the trees from the upper layers. If you've got the trees, then you look down the list and pick some of the lower layers, an understory or the low shrub layer or the herbaceous layer. So fill in the understory and I'm still working on filling in my understory because I didn't really think about the importance of layers when I was first, I guess, allowing my forest and I weeded out too many things that I didn't know. I had a wild plum, which I'm like, I wasn't sure what it was. So I took it out and then it came back and then I saw it blooming and I'm like, oh, how could I weed that out? And so, so now I'm trying to ID as plants come in. <clears throat> Covering the ground we have used mulch way too much. And instead of mulching, covering the ground with the, the sedges and the perennials, <clears throat> and finding things like this golden ragwort, which, you know, we've all, you know, stop kind of try thinking about control and where do the plants want to go and let them go and buy plants that not the invasive, non-natives, but natives that like to spread, and it really saves you work. Discovering sedges, which I've mentioned, and you can see on the left there, in the top left, that's, I think it's a Pennsylvania sedge, but I'm not positive, because again, it came in, and um, you can see it blooming. Rutterals, this is a brown-eyed Susan, which is a biannual or short-lived perennial, and it just pops up everywhere in the garden, and I love it because it just fills in the gaps. So just what we, I, I think what we need now in this time of climate crisis and biodiversity crisis is just deeply love the wild earth and doing that by planting our yards. Jack Turner, a philosopher says that there's knowledge only the wild can give us. These are its gifts to us. What's needed is direct experience with a place over time, complete immersion, observing the bird migrations, animal mating, leafing of trees, climate patterns, the pollinators, the insects, the spiders, the fireflies. And I'm not going to read this, but this was my husband sent me this email a few years ago, <clears throat> the one who wanted a normal front yard. And just I'll read his last sentence, bringing the wild back into the urban spaces is empowering, attainable, and I hope will be soon be common. So my winter wonderland will stretch as far as I can see. So this if you have a spouse or a partner that's not on board right now, there is hope. <laughs> and here, if you're interested in little forests, now on the Master Gardener website, we have a whole page to learn about them and what they are and how you can actually plant one yourself. And so that species list that is shared. If you wanna get involved, that second link is it's a survey that you can sign up to be involved or you can support it. We have a GoFundMe to plant um, the four little forests that we're planting this year. And the, they're gonna be at Lakeside, at um, Kingston Secondary School, at Walking the Path of Peace on Highway 15 on Wolf Island. And a little forest is like 200 square meters. So not small, but 1200 species per little forest. And that's it in questions. Thank you so much, Joyce. That was really interesting. There are a few questions up on chat, so I will see if I can run through a few of those. Um, we had one, um, uh, somebody asked about the, pro what is, or is there a problem with lily of the valley other than it being invasive? Not really. I mean, it just, 
I find it I find it a little bit thuggish and it spreads a lot and I still have some that I'm trying to get rid of because there's other plants I'd rather have but it does smell beautiful I don't know though <clears throat> one of the things that I always do now because I do have non-native plants as you probably saw from some of the pictures in my garden is I watch them and I watch to see who visits are there pollinators visiting are there insects visiting are there birds visiting and if nobody's visiting them then they go I take them out but if if there's like creatures visiting them then sure they stay that's that's actually ties directly into a question somebody else asked a little earlier she said she has uh, um, a number of non-native species but bees seem to love them is it okay to leave those yeah but the only thing to watch is which bees because honeybees are and um, Vicki may want to jump in here too because honeybees are very are real generalists so they'll visit a lot of plants um, some of our specialist bees though are pickier so I would keep an eye on which bees visit and Vicki did you have something to say on that one no Julius that's correct so honeybees and bumblebees as well actually will go to the broadest range of plants uh, and then there are some further specifics. Uh, I think the major thing is that if it's a native plant, a native bee will go to it. Honeybees will, however, go to things that are not native, just ornamental, so not necessarily invasive, but those plants may not attract the native bees, but would a honeybee? Uh, just for reference, but correct. <laughs> Somebody, I think you got into this a little bit, Joyce, but somebody asked about, do you compost in mulch? <laughs> My composting is all in place. I just kind of stick it and tuck it in around the yard. And mulch, I use arborist wood chips. So the, if you see somebody wood chipping in your area, those are the absolute best thing to improve your soil. Do not buy the shredded bark that they sell. The arborist wood chips, like really they bring in the fungal, um, the mycorrhizae and they just, they feed the soil. So as I've been working on my yard, when I don't yet have enough, because it takes time to build that herbaceous layer, then I do use the arborist wood chips. Okay, um, for the little forests you are planting, are you planting only trees and shrubs and waiting for the understory or planting all? Uh, and I guess you got into that a little bit, but if you could yeah, we're right. planting four layers. So canopy, um, the canopy, which is the tallest trees, and then the tree layer, which are the trees that don't get quite as tall, understory and shrub layers. So those four layers. And we are going to do like the armor wood chips for mulch. And then after about three years, once they establish, then we're going to bring in some of the herbaceous and the sedges. All right, maybe time for one more. Um, someone's asked, will these close plantings choke out bindweed? It's taken over their yard and she fights with it every year, um, kills plants. Well, I, I would say um, the shade, the bindweed is more of a sun liking plant. So if you're gonna have a forest, then that will start shading it out over time. And if you do do the heavy, um, the wood chip mulch. So if you wanna start with the trees and shrubs and do a thick layer of wood chips that, that I fought in one piece of my yard with fine weed for, I think it was four years with um, cardboard <laughs> and thick wood chips. I actually took all the plants out. But if you've got a lot of area, then a forest and shade over time might be the easiest way. <laughs> Oh, that was great. Thank you very much, Joyce um, and Vicki. Um, I think at this point, we're going to move on to the photo sharing portion of the event. So I think that's all of the photos. Um, there were um, a couple more questions, but I think um, maybe we'll um, just tackle one of these. It was uh, quite a bit of discussion around ticks. So uh, we sure have loads of ticks. Um, and uh, somebody's asking about whether there's, there's species that would be appropriate. I think Joyce mentioned that she has not got ticks. And um, I don't know, Joyce, do you want to maybe weigh in on some of your experience in that regard? Yeah, I mentioned in the chat that I'd be doing a lot more research on ticks this summer. 
I haven't had ticks yet. Um, I mentioned possums eat ticks. I guess they're voracious tick eaters and I had heard they were in Napanee. Somebody replied to me, I don't think it was in the public chat, that they spotted a dead roadkill possum on um, Woodbine, I think it was Woodbine Road. So possums are coming. So a habitat that attracts possums is great. Um, but wood chips, they definitely don't like wood chips. And so the wood chips that I've mentioned, if you use those, they don't cross them. So that's a barrier. Um, the wild turkeys, all the, and the little birds that like ticks. Just doing okay. things to attract all the other species because ticks are, they're here, they're probably going to increase. Um, and so it's more learning how to live with them because we don't want to, like Asheville, our whole city because of ticks. So it's how do we attract the species that will prevent the ticks or plant in such a way that that makes them less likely. And the planting patterns is something that I'm going to be looking at. That's great. I was actually the one who uh, emailed or messaged you. I, I have seen a road, unfortunate roadkill, but I've seen a possum on Midland Avenue in Kingston. So yeah, yeah in the UK definitely. they actually have a big uh, a big effort around hedgehogs, yeah. and it's almost like a, what's the ideal possum habitat, and let's all build the ideal possum habitats in our yard, and maybe that's the best thing that we can do. Great. All right. Well, I think I would uh, like to at this point just uh, thank you all for coming and for sharing. Uh, big thank you to our speakers uh, for their very informative presentations, for sure. Uh, you can follow the Land Conservancy on the usual social media platforms, so Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. Uh, I'd like to sponsor, thank our sponsor once again, and that's Birds Greenhouses. And at this point, we're going to do the draw for um, uh, a gift certificates. So I'm going to turn it over to Vicki, who's going to draw the name of one lucky participant. And I'll just say everyone's name has been entered into the draw. And the people who shared a photo or two got an extra ballot. So we're drawing for a $50 gift certificate from Burt's Greenhouses.